Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. I'm coming to you today from Calabasas, California. The facility we're in is part of the Yamaha Guitar Group. We're in the uh, Line 6 section of the uh, of the facility. We're with Eric Klein. How you doing? I'm doing great. Chief Product Design Architect. Yes. Did I get it? You got it. Nice. Or as we like to, uh, to call you, Mr. Helix. Uh, one of many Mr. And, and Ms. Helices, yes. <laughs> but you've really been in, deeply involved in the whole For Helix years, project. Yes. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Take us a little bit through the, the evolution of that, how the, the product kind of came about and, and where we're at today. Um, the, the initial first conversations were before I joined Line 6. Um, I think it was 2008. And right as the economy just dumped they realized, well, nobody's going to spend $1,500 on a modeler right now. Let's hold off. And instead, they did Pod HD. Mm-hmm. So that was 2010. And then uh, Helix began in 2011, and it released in 2015. So if you look on the side of a box, it says P21 for Helix. If you look at, a, at the side of a box of HD 500X, it says P22. So we actually started Helix before HD 500X. So it's right. been it's been a long time. Right. So that's what about four years to develop mm-hmm. the the product from concept to shipping. Uh, it was it was fully fleshed out in 2011. So it was four years of active development. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So what does that mean, active development? Does that mean working on the software? Does that mean creating the models and the software? Uh, that means a bunch of parallel groups, uh, like the system architects building the infrastructure, uh, sound designers capturing amps and effects, um, UI team going in and designing the layout and the graphics, mechanical, electrical, lots of different disciplines working in parallel, uh, all dedicated to that project from the beginning, they weren't splintering off and coming in and helping. It was a huge team of people straight from 2011 all the way to release and then beyond, of course. So. Right, right, mm-hmm. sure, sure. From your viewpoint, being so intimately involved with all of that that development through, uh, through the process, what are the, the big advantages of the Helix? What really sets it apart? Um, the it's, it's not readily apparent to a lot of people, but it's, it's a platform and we were sort of hesitant to talk about it early on because we didn't want people saying, well, I'm just going to wait for the next thing in the platform, but it's pretty fleshed out now. So, um, it's, it's, it's an engine and an architecture that can, that can go in all sorts of different ways, depending on, on customer feedback. So if, if a customer says, we really want to be able to pull this off. Could you, could Helix do this? We get together, sometimes that night I'll get a text from one of our firmware engineers and and he'll go, hey, can I do this? I'm like, yes, but call it this and maybe make the values change from this to this, like done. And the next morning it's in the firmware. Wow. So it's been a little difficult because the original architecture of Helix was, uh, was different than what we ended up doing starting with Helix native plugin. So that's something we internally call Helix Core. It's not that important to our customers, but um, we hadn't been able to crank out a ton of features because we have to recode everything two or three times because we're running on different architectures. Right. So the last nine months, our team has been going back and making sure that Helix, Helix Rack Control, and Helix LT are also running on Helix Core. So now that that's all but finished, um, I like to tell the story because <laughs> it was it was not uh, all weekend. I keep getting emails and pings from our development software that our our lead engineer kept adding features because now that core is done, he's like, hey, I added this. And he started going through the backlog and saying, how about this? I'm like, no, how about if you did this thing instead? And and now suddenly we woke up Monday morning and there are 15 new features in Helix. Nice. And, you know, and then this morning there were another six. Right. And some of them are big, some of them are small, but um, but all of the things that we just like, oh, I really wish we could do that, but we can't. We got to wait until the whole core thing is done. Now that that's opened, it's uh, it's going to be a lot more fun going forward. So that's kind of like a, I guess, a unified platform for exactly. all of the different Helix family. Exactly, and like. not just hardware, but software as well. So uh, a big part of the 2.80 update that's coming out is we're just kind of internally calling it HX Unity. But um, if you have um, if you have Helix, Helix LT, Helix Rack, HX Effects, or HX Stomp, you can now get the plugin for 99 bucks. Doesn't matter what you have. So we want we want everybody to own the plugin and understand the advantages of being able to do the studio to stage and back again promise. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you'll also be able to transfer presets seamlessly back and forth. So um, before you had to copy and paste certain blocks, and sometimes it wouldn't work 
perfectly and sometimes the snapshots weren't great. It worked, but you had to work a little bit at it. Now it's, I can just take my HXFX preset straight into Helix and it just works nice. in the plugin. Right. Uh, and then for the hardcore studio and DAW guys like myself, I mean, Helix native is the thing that I actually use most often. Uh, we're turning off the hardware compatibility mode or the ability to turn that off. So now you can add as many blocks as you want until you run out of DSP hmm. as fast as your computer will let you. So right. we're really excited about that as well. Ah, cool stuff. Cool stuff. So I'm, I'm curious, one of the other things, in addition to the, the constant firmware updates and the, the things that you're talking about with the, the core and this whole unifying thing, is that you guys are also always modeling new amplifiers mm -hmm. and always looking at the, the basic building blocks of the tone, which is the, yep. the amplifier. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, that, that process. How do you choose an amplifier and, and what goes into all that? Uh, it's, it's a lot of different things and there isn't an easy answer to that. Sometimes it's what's, what are thing people buzzing about right now? I mean, we'll, we, you know, obviously we're on modeling forums, but we all own our amps and, and we're on amp forums and we're on pedal forums. So if people are really talking about a specific amp, well, all right, let's let's see what this is. Let's see if the company want you know is is interested in working with us. Let's see if um, let's see how easy it is to do. Right. Um, sometimes people ask for amps that take two or three months to model fully all four channels. So uh, sometimes it's uh, we realize you know there's kind of a gaping hole in our repertoire. There's there we don't have a we don't have an amp that happens to sing in a certain way or it doesn't have a certain type of bite because um, none of the models happen to exhibit that behavior. So Ben and Sam will go in and make custom amps as well, which is a lot of fun because once you have the tools, you can you can build an amp completely in the virtual world that doesn't exist or in some cases could not exist without blowing up after five seconds. Right. Or in the case of the, the trainer amp that's over here, which is actually, I think it's a modded Marshall circuit in there, but it's an amp that Ben had been fiddling with for... A better part of a decade going in and tweaking things, adding different resistors and different caps, and um, and he got it to where it, he loved it, and he would just play it at lunch, and a bunch of us heard it. We're like, "That's great! You should model that." And he's like, "Really? This is just my sort of weird, noisy, loud rock and roll amp." We're like, "No, <laughs> do it!" And it ended up being the uh, cartographer, and it's one of our most popular amp models. Oh, so cool. that, that's very cool. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. So, do you interact directly with manufacturers who make the amplifiers? Do you interact directly with artists? Uh, is it all coming from in-house here, as far as your choices go? Uh, it's all internal. Um, sometimes it's an artist who says, "I really, really want you guys to model this particular thing." I can't. It's a little too soon, but we're talking to a couple artists and getting some some famous pedals and some famous amps that were done on huge massive records and we're going to nice. probably take take that apart and um and it's uh it's it's always changing it's always interesting and it's always weird and and if we have a set style or a set process of what we model or what we don't model it gets boring because then we see a big list and we're just checking things off a list it's a lot more fun to go uh, okay we're halfway done with that but this is suddenly really cool and it's a lot more fun let's do this Right. And then we can come back to that later if we want. So. Right, right. So you briefly mentioned that firmware 2.8.0 is, mm -hmm. is about to be released. We're, we're talking here just before. It's still a few we're, months away. Still, okay, we're about to out. announce it. We're going to announce it at the uh, Helix users party on Friday, which I think this video it would be last Friday. Probably about time this, yeah. Yeah, this so, comes out. So sometime in the immediate past. Yeah, yeah so, so, like um, so it's, it's going to be... Uh, because we thought it was going to be a minor update, and it turned out because Helix Core is now done, it ended up a much bigger update. Right. Which uh, which is surprising, and I'm sure there'll be a bunch of extra things that we don't mention on Friday night that will sneak in as well. So, can you give us any kind of a, a sneak preview of what might be in that? Yeah, uh, that the update? the HX Unity thing is a is a big deal with the, with both the plugin and the the editor. Um, we're calling this the Missed Connections update. Hmm. So. Um, so a lot of the things that we wanted to do with connecting to PowerCab and connecting to even like the DT25 and DT50, stuff that HD, Pod HD used to be able to do. Now Helix is going to be able to do that in a much more powerful, much more flexible, much more seamless way. Um, and also connections with Variax. So currently you can change the pitch of each string with snapshots or with a controller or with a foot switch. Um, but the software allows you to change volume per string, but you have to hook up into the software. With 2.8, you'll be able to actually go in and change the volume of each string independently. Hmm. So from snapshot to snapshot, you could have 
strings three and four turn off. Or if a particular tone is a little bit ringy on the top end, you could turn the high E string down to 82%. Or you could have three strings blend in with the expression pedal or MIDI or something like that. Right. So that's really exciting. Uh, you'll be able to use the output block in Helix as a remote control for power cab or DT50s. So you'll be able to focus on which of the two amps you're looking at. And you'll be able to choose which IR is in power cab or which speaker mode it's in or any of the actual t analog tube topology that's in the DT50. You'll be able to remotely control that hmm. and um, save that to presets, but also actively and dynamically control it with foot switches, expression pedals, MIDI. Um, and you'll be able to ch change parameters in uh, power cab or DT from the volume knob on your Variax, weird things like that. So wow. the notion of all of these products working together being sort of um, where the sum is is greater than, or the, <laughs> you know. The sum is greater than the, yes, the, the, the yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> Something about that. It's there's been some, a long day. Some We're getting ready for there, right? <laughs> yes, there's some mathematics in there. So, um, so that's a big deal. I have my little cheat sheet here because we just finalized things. Um, my my favorite pet feature that I talk about online that I, I'm not allowed to talk about, we finally got in, uh, and that's uh, QWERTY keystrokes from foot switches. Hmm. So, um, so instead of using it as a MIDI controller, you can now connect it to a Mac or PC and control literally any piece of software ever made. Oh, wow. So not just DAWs, but video games or PowerPoint or video playback, or if you want to jam along with YouTube, you can control playback of YouTube, control volume of YouTube versus your guitar playing, uh, change the speed of YouTube. Right. Um, so it's so as far as a jamming solution, it becomes a lot more fun as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. So, That's very cool. That's so. very cool. So lots of great stuff. And lots and lots of little things too. So Right, right. Well, that's, I look forward to it. It's going yeah. to be a lot of fun. It's going to be fun. So I have a couple more questions for yeah. you. Because you're so deep into the modeling world, what is the biggest misconception that you think people have about models? Oh, um, it's the playback system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually, it's, I think I actually have a hashtag, it's the playback system, stupid. <laughs> um, when people talk about modeling or modelers, they talk about how it doesn't feel like an amp or it doesn't feel like, I, I, if, yeah, if I plug into a Marshall full stack, it doesn't feel that way. Modelers just don't have that. And the answer is they can't because there's no speaker built into a modeler. So when, when you're playing through a big 4x12, the fact that this is wood and the fact that you're using guitar drivers and the fact that you're playing at a specific volume, there's a behavior and there's a feel that you get from this that you can't get from another playback system, whether it's headphones or an FRFR speaker or, um, or a PA, plastic PA speaker, something like that. Right. So, so what something like power cab does is it attempts to bridge that gap so because it's made of actual birch ply because it actually has a guitar speaker built in it's closer to the behavior and the feel of a real one by 12 cabinet in the room mm -hmm. than a pa speaker or even an frfr speaker is right but it doesn't sound like a two by 12 or four by 12 because it's not that so um so it it, it can be a little frustrating when people say, hey, my my five inch studio monitors don't feel like a roaring plexi. It must be the modeler. Right. Except it's the playback system. Right. So it's those five inch woofers are just yeah. never going to deliver. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Your playback system is at least half of your tone mm -hmm. and it's well over half of the experience of playing with with an amp. Right. Mm -hmm. So given that, uh, you know, understanding that. What is the number one thing that a user of a modeler can do to get the best experience aside from the playback system? Is there are there other things you can do? Um, well, whatever your playback system, if you can crank it as loud as possible, it's going to get you probably closest to that experience. Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't blow up, you don't want it to blow up, obviously. But right. um, but if you, but a lot of the models, the defaults that you hear, a lot of amps sound best when they're cranked. So, um, and we have no control and, and no knowledge of what somebody's going to connect Helix to. So if you pull up the Plexi model, we have the master volume dimed because it sounds best dimed. But if you're listening to that at bedroom volumes, it's going to sound weird. It's like it's going to sound harsh and bizarre because you're now taking this huge expanse of sound and condensing it into a much smaller playback system. But if, you, if you're able to turn that up or... 
or turned the master volume down in the model, you can better approximate what the real thing would sound like in the room. Okay, right. So it's really that matter of balancing that physical response you expect. Absolutely. With what what it's really able to do. Yep. Right. But it also it's also due to your expectations and your experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to recording studios. So I'm used to having an amp in the other room, mic'd up, but I'm in the control room playing remotely, hearing it through studio monitors. So that's natural to me. Mm -hmm. But I freely admit that that's not natural to a lot of other people. And so listening to a mic'd up amp in another room through studio monitors is what modeling does. Right. It's how, it's what every modeler, that's how it works. You have to emulate the recorded sound of an amp. You can't emulate how your ears hear it because you're, you can't capture what your ears are hearing without a microphone. So Right, right. Now you guys had a demonstration going a little bit earlier here today where, where there was a Helix and an amplifier with the same model of that. And, oh, uh, with, with Ben and Sam. Yeah, and it was yeah, playing, playing yeah. through the studio monitors, and they were switching back and forth between the speaker out here that was mic'd up and the Helix mm -hmm. in, in there, and it was indistinguishable yeah. because you're hearing it through that playback system that you, yep. were, that you were talking about. Yep, but yeah. if, with, a, with an identical playback system, Modern modelers, like high-end modelers, they're really, really, really close. Right, right. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Man, thank you so much for spending time with us today, Absolutely. Eric. It's, it's really cool. Of course, we love Helix uh, and all, the whole family of, of Helix products. Thanks, it's, thanks. Uh, congratulations on all that. Thank and, you, guys. Uh, and the whole platform thing. It's so exciting mm -hmm. and, and 2.8. So really appreciate it. Thanks so awesome. much for giving thank us you. your time today. Great appreciate to see it. you. Yep. Right on. And thank you for joining me here at Yamaha Guitar Group. We're at Line 6. This is Eric Klein. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.